Good morning. And a warm welcome to all of you who are watching uh, from home or wherever you're watching from online. It's great that you're here today. Um, today, uh, we want to give a special uh, welcome to the Nanninga family. Now, they've been around and you might have bumped into them in the hallway, but uh, we want to, and oh, they're still in the foyer, so we're not going to welcome them just yet. They're getting their, getting their family together, I guess. But anyway, we're going we're gonna to welcome them uh, a little bit later. And uh, also, this, this morning, we're going to be hearing from Paul Luchibor. And Paul, are you around somewhere? You want to... Oh, there, there's, there we go. Hey, Paul, great to see you. And, and Paul is a... Yeah, let's give him a round of applause, okay? Um, so Paul uh, is a son of this church. He's, he's gone off to be a missionary, and he's going to be telling us all about his work uh, today, so we look forward to that. Come on, come on right on up, uh, Mike and Loretta and Seth and Paul. Are the whole crew going to come up? There we go. Yeah, let's get, go ahead and get on. So, yeah, hi. Hi, Paul. Um, so we, uh, uh, we are the ultimate neighbors. We, are, we, we now live four doors apart, at least until the end of September. Uh, we drive the same path to work, and then we end up you know, with only a wall separating us. So this is, this is Mike's life and mine. But uh, anyway, you've been around, you've met some of the people, but we, we, didn't, want to, uh, we didn't want to let you just kind of slip into the church. We wanted to just give you a, a warm welcome. And so welcome Mike and Loretta and Seth and Paul. And let's, get, let's give them a big hand again. Oh, good. Great. Okay, thanks a lot. Thanks for saying yes to the call. Thanks for everything. Thanks for your love for Maranatha Church and everything you're going to do. Somebody sent me a, a video link this week, and it was a video link of... Uh, John Eldritch being interviewed by Carrie Newhoff. And I don't know if you know those people, it doesn't really matter, but the point was that John Eldritch was saying, we think we're through this pandemic emotionally. He says, but we're not. It's not that easy. We've gone through two years of international trauma, and, and it's, it's, it's not, just not so easy. And he said, let me give you a for instance. He said, before COVID, there were 10 incidences reported of passenger like aggression and, and things like this on airplanes uh, around the world. He said in 2021, that number went up to 100 per month. And then this year, it was 350 per month around the world. And in other words, he says, you know, stuff is happening in our hearts, and we may not fully realize it, but sometimes it, we experience it in that we just want to unplug, we want to cocoon, maybe you felt feelings like that, you're, you're grateful for an excuse to get out of an invitation sometimes because you just need to be alone and recharge. He said, this is all of the effects of this trauma. And what he's saying, what he was saying is, not only do we need to be aware of that for the sake of, you know, caring well for ourselves, but he says the solution is to find, find our life in God and find his power, and that is why we gather on a Sunday morning. And it's very appropriate that I, I got this video link this week, because today we're talking about Jesus' invitation, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. And, and Jesus shows us the way to deal with the trauma of COVID. Now, would you stand with me as we begin our worship? We want to praise the Lord with, with music, and, but let's do that in the awareness that God isn't just watching, that God is here with us today. Grace to you, everyone, and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.
finite mind it's so hard but we do our best to call you good and holy and just and beautiful but those are just words they don't just really describe you how can we do this it's impossible but we do it anyways father because you are who you are and we want the world to know that Holy Spirit, lead and guide us. Reveal the, the work of the cross as we sing this song. Reveal the Father's heart. That's what you want. That's what you do. You reveal the heart of Christ, the heart of the Father to us. 
deep in our soul. And then that changes us, it transforms us, it makes us into people that want to follow you and lay down our lives and give it all for the sake of the gospel. But here we are, worshiping you, adoring you. Holy Spirit, as we sing this, reveal what you want to do. Your work is to reveal the Father's heart. You're here to reveal who Jesus is. And we've just scratched the surface of who you are. Help us to draw near to you this morning. That's all we want. That's all our soul wants and needs is you. The things you give us, we thank you. The things that you, the prayers that you answer and the prayers that you don't, it doesn't make a difference because peace comes from your presence. Joy comes from your presence. And just open up your hearts this morning, everyone, and just let's just wait a moment. And just give it all up. Just surrender it, whatever it is. Fear, doubt, struggle that you're going through. It's not easy, is it? He's here. He's in your soul. And he wants to embrace you and fill you and empower you and break down the, the walls and break the chains. Come, Holy Spirit. Someone said to me once, listen, you're telling me that I got, you, you want me to have an intimate relationship with the Father when I never even knew what that was at all. My Father, there's no intimacy whatsoever. But yet, God says it's possible. So make it possible, Father. There is nothing worth more that will ever come close. Nothing can compare.
Thank you, Deborah and the priest team. Let's take a moment to uh, go before our Lord in prayer, shall we? Father, we, we do want to declare to you today that uh, as our congregation, as a church, Lord, that your Holy Spirit is welcome here. And Lord, we just thank you for that amazing gift. We just thank you for the opportunity that we have to share in that gift. Jesus, your name is the name. And uh, Lord, we'd be nothing without you. And sometimes we tend to forget that. And Father, um, for those times, Lord, we just ask your forgiveness. And uh, we just ask that your presence will be with us mightily. We ask that you would speak to each one of us where we are at and our needs that where we are at, Lord. And we know that you can do that. And we just thank you for that. Lord, I just thank you for each person in this church, whether they're here or at home, online. Um, Lord, I just ask that you continue to just be with them and hold them up. There's been a a period of loss recently, Lord. We think of uh, Saska and the passing of her father last Sunday. We think of Wendon and the passing of his mother last Tuesday. Lord, and to... uh, Jessica and Jared and the sudden passing of their father, Lord. I just, there's a lot of questions can be asked at these times. And Lord, we know that your plan is greater than ours. And uh, we just ask that you would uphold these families. um, Just keep them in your hand at this time. We thank you, Lord, that uh, Lucy's surgery went so well and and that she's returned home already. Lord, it's just a blessing and we're just so thankful. Um, Lord, we just continue to lift up those uh, that you can see listed in your bulletin as well for Glenn, for Martin, Eve, and Andy, and, and Rick, and, and others in our congregation, Lord, that may not be feeling well or um, just may be in need of you. We just, again, ask your spirit to work there. And we just pray that your spirit would work amongst people in this church, Lord, too, that they can reach out and uh, just, just touch them and love them, Father. Lord, as uh, we continue this service, just be with Tom as he shares, and be with Paul as he shares, and uh, Lord, just uh, use their words mightily, Lord, to speak to us today. And we just ask all these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Just uh, one announcement to make, and then Wanda and Sarita are going to be making another announcement. So I'll invite Wanda and Sarita to come up right now while I say that uh, Lionel and Carolyn Ray are celebrating their 45th anniversary on Saturday. So let's give them a round. Everybody knows Carolyn. Carolyn's the one that gives gifts to everybody. It's, it's amazing. She's, uh, she's a real blessing to this community. So just thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm standing in for Paul. Uh, not Paul. Sorry, for Adam this weekend as he's away. Uh, We just wanted to give you a a short uh, video clip of Brett Allman and tell you why we have offered him um, to the congregation for parents. We're bringing him in under the young adults uh, because he has the unique ability to speak to some really hot topic issues that um, are of real concern for our younger generation and unfortunately for the parents of kids coming up. Um, As our culture continues to war against our Christian norms and values, it is so difficult for our young people, and for any of us really, if we're honest, to navigate this biblically and soundly. So we'd like to show you a brief clip and um, really offer, extend the invitation, though it says for parents on Friday night, Please come and be educated, whatever your age is, of what is in our culture and how we can war against it. Um, You know, as as wise as a serpent and yet as gentle as a dove. Thank you. Father came up to me and said, Brett, how do I talk to my daughter about sex? By the way, she hates me. I said, what do you mean she hates you? And he said, oh, forget about that. How do I talk to her about sex? I'm like, dude, forget about sex. What do you mean she hates you? And I realized that I have spent 25 years now talking 
to parents and leaders, but I've never addressed the foundations. Culture is just so different. If you look at the ages that kids are dealing with things, sometimes I think parents don't even know what to do. How do we talk to a, a you know, grade six kid about sex or pornography or what they might see online? How to deal with alcohol and drugs, how to deal with interpersonal relationships and communication with teachers, and there's a million things. And that doesn't start as a parent like June of your grade 12 year. But you talk about everything, so there's no unwritten rules. I would have yearly family meetings. These studies that say if you eat dinner together, all the negative things parents don't want, drugs, alcohol, sex, kids dropping out of school, all of those things go really far down. Our kids are not with us forever. We better prepare them for life. Be there. Good morning. Need to pull up my notes because I have four announcements and a welcome. So first, there is a welcome party going on for Chris and Jancy and their family. It's going to be at the Wadhams, and it's going to be next Sunday. What we need you to do is if you want to come, there will be a sign-up sheet at the information desk after the service. Okay? There's also a Facebook event as well, too. So please RSVP. Um, fall kickoff. There is going to be a fall kickoff September the 11th. Um, there's going to be food, there's going to be a good time, and it's just going to be a fabulous way to kick off our year um, ahead of us. If you would like to help out in any capacity, please come and speak to me. I would love your help. Um, coffee team organizer. So we are looking for a coffee team organizer. So not necessarily to make coffee, but to organize it. So um, we need somebody to organize the coffee teams and make sure everybody knows what to do. All right. Also, we need a new coffee maker. A coffee maker. And I'm not talking about a machine, so don't go out and buy one. I'm talking about a person. We need a live coffee maker. Right now, it's only three people every week. They come in and they make the coffee in the fellowship hall. We need more coffee makers. So if you know how to make coffee, you know, if you're going to somebody's house after church, be sure to compliment them. You know, you make a fabulous cup of coffee. This is really, really good coffee, you know. Yes. So if you know somebody knows how to make coffee, if not, we'll teach you. All right. That's enough for announcements. Now I would like to welcome and call up Paul Luchibor. I don't know if he's coming alone or with his fam jam, but uh, he's coming alone. So just want to introduce, lift up your hand if you know who Paul is. Yes. All right. Well, then I don't need to, everything I'm about to say, you're going to know because you know him better than I do. Um, he is the son of Roberta. And lift up your hand if you know Roberta. Yeah, that's what I thought. Lots of people famous. Uh, Paul grew up in this church. He went to Belleville Christian School, fabulous school. He went to QCHS, fabulous school. He went to high school with Mike, Pastor Mike, and um, has many connections here. He is now doing ministry in Germany, and it's always a proud moment and a blessing when um, a child grows up and loves the Lord, but how much more proud when they are loving the Lord, but doing it full time um, and just serving. So we are excited to hear from him. He's no longer a child. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, how do you fit six years in a, a five minute snapshot uh, for you guys? That's my intention uh, for being here this morning. I would love to speak to every, each and every one of you, but uh, I, I thought it'd be easier just to do it up here uh, in this way. But uh, where do you start? Where do you start? So I thought I would start uh, just by expressing my encouragement, even stepping through the doors here. Uh, so the Apostle Paul, when he writes his letters to the churches, in the majority of his greetings and introduction, he would say, I never stop ceasing to pray for you guys because of the love you have for each other and the faith that you have in Jesus Christ. And so for Paul, he's so encouraged whenever he, he sees a local body gathered together. And, and for me to step foot in these doors, I, I think it must have been four or five years, you know, I still see familiar faces. And my brothers and sisters here, uh, 
persevering and striving to serve Christ. And for me, I get encouraged when I see that. And so that's where I want to start too, is just my encouragement uh, for even being here and to share in five minutes uh, my work in Germany. And so six years ago, I packed my bags, uh, yeah, with clothes and a few books, and I, set, uh, I flew to Germany. Uh, so not, I didn't have much with me, and I was quite naive. I just thought, oh, I have my clothes and my bags and, and my books, but I really had no plan. I thought, my only plan is to marry my wife. <laughs> and so for my first year in Germany, I, I just intensively learned the language there. I spent one year learning German, and by God's grace, I can now speak it fluently. Uh, I'm currently preaching in Germany and serving in, Germany, in German. Sorry. And so after that first year of learning the language, I thought, okay, what now? So lingering in the back of my mind, I thought, I, I want to serve uh, Christ in some manner, but I, di I didn't know how that's going to look like. And so I, I, I knew at this moment, well, I, I need a job. I need some sort of income to support my wife and family. And so um, I, I started applying for English teaching jobs, English as a second language. And I applied to, they call them a Sprachschule, a Sprachschule, a speaking school. And so uh, a speaking school, they would freelance you out to different companies in Germany or in Darmstadt, and I would teach business English to the business people of Darmstadt. And so I, I applied to one Sprachschule, and they hired me, and <laughs> within two weeks, I was in my first company teaching English. And you can meet me in the back, and I have a funny story to tell you, my first English lesson. Uh, if, if you're curious to hear more about that, uh, I can tell you later. But uh, I taught English for four years. I taught English for four years. And in these four years, this is where I had a, this burning desire or, or this joy to teach. I really didn't know I, I wouldn't enjoy teaching so much. But I started to love teaching. And for me, it was just watching people grow, just watching people comprehend something and then later apply that immediately. And so for learning a language, you know, they would listen to me and then apply it, and their grammar was excellent, and I said, yes, like they can grow and, 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 and do this. And so for me to see them grow what was just wonderful, but also coupled with a passion to teach the Bible, I thought, well, pastoring would be like a dream job, you know, to teach the Bible and to help people mature in their faith and to watch people grow in Christ. I thought there's no greater job that I could. And, and so I felt that this was God's pull on me, his pull on our hearts uh, to, to pastor, get in the pastoral ministry. And so as I was teaching for four years, I was approached by Youth for Christ in Germany and they were setting up a whole new paradigm in their ministry. And, and they said, yeah, we, we want to be more local. So at the time, uh, Youth for Christ in, in Darmstadt, that's where I'm from, in Germany, they would serve all of Germany. And, and it was too broad for them. They wanted to narrow their roots. And so they, they said, we need someone who's more extroverted, who's into sports, and who can connect with the local youth at the Spielplatz, at the playgrounds there. And so immediately, if you know the German culture, it's, it's quite hard to connect with individuals. And so I said, you know, I'll give it a shot. And so I started working with Youth for Christ and uh, part-time, and I cut down some classes for teaching part-time, and I was, doing bo I was working with both jobs. And, and slowly, you know, I was working with Youth for Christ, and I said, you know, this, this needs to be a full-time job. If Youth for Christ really wants to be fruitful with a ministry like this to, to reach kids uh, at the Spielplatz, at the playgrounds, you need to do this full-time. To do this part-time isn't going to work. And so my wife and I, we, we prayed about it, and uh, we decided to just cut ties with teaching English and to move into full-time ministry with Youth for Christ. And so this way, I could connect on a deeper level with the youth that I was engaging in. And uh, I, was start, I started working full-time with Youth for Christ in January. And so just to give you a, a snapshot of what I do, I pack my car with uh, soccer balls and basketballs, and I, I drive to uh, soccer fields, I drive to basketball courts, and really I just strategize it in such a way where I, where I meet the youth and I just start playing with them. And the intentions are to build relationships with them. 
And as a result, you know, consequently, I've, I've been able to build close relationships with at least eight of them, with eight youth. And so I'm, I'm in perpetual contact with these youth, and, and, and our hope for these youth, they're not churchgoers. These kids have never stepped foot in the church. But our hope is to somehow plug them into a church where they can be shepherded as well and grow in their faith. And so that's the idea of the work there. I go to the, the sport facilities, build relationships with the youth, and somehow plug them into a local church body where they too can be shepherded and grow that way. So I started that in January, but this fact of pastoring has, has not gone away. And I told my wife, I need some, I need some theological foundation here. Um, to be a pastor, it's not an easy job. Mike uh, knows a lot about that too. Tom probably knows a lot about that too. And, and there has to be some sort of theological education. We, we are educators, right, of the word. And so I said, Julia, we, we, we need a background here. And, and so I, uh, I, while I was teaching English, I, I finished a bachelor in theology at Moody Institute. And uh, after that, I, I subsequently said, you know, I, I need a more comprehensive study. So Moody was great, but I needed more comprehensive study. And so just recently, well, two years ago, I applied uh, for an MDiv program in Berlin. Uh, and so I've been studying at a, for a divinity degree uh, with a European Bible Training Center, uh, which is a part-time study. So I study that part-time, and I work with Youth for Christ full-time. Um, and I also, we also serve in our local church to, to edify the body there. Uh, but with the hope of graduating with an MDiv degree in six years. And so after that, after four years or four years to go, our hope is to either plant a church in Germany or take over an existing church plant and pastor uh, there. So we're set on setting our roots in Germany and Europe. We're, we're hoping to be there long term, but uh, only the Lord knows uh, the ways of our lives. Um, but we can direct our ways, the Lord guides them. Uh, so we will make decisions, uh, but our hearts are set on Germany and Europe, and we'll be there for some time anyways. But this is just a snapshot of our life, um, and if you can pray for us uh, to support us in any sort of means, uh, you can reach me in the back. I'll be standing there, and if you're curious to hear more about what we do in Germany, please don't hesitate to ask us. We're, we're more than open to answer questions and to connect with each of you individually. So thank you for your support and prayers, and it's a blessing to be here again. Run away. Let's pray for you right now. Paul, uh, come back. We're going to pray for you. You asked for prayer, and I think we should do that right, right away. Father in heaven, thank you for this uh, child of yours who obviously loves you and wants to serve you and who's just full of an eagerness. And we pray for an anointing on him. We pray for that your Holy Spirit would rest upon him and fill him and bless him, bless his family, and bless this church he will plant or this church he will um, assume leadership of, and let him see people coming to Jesus, people growing in Jesus. Give him his heart's desire, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay. I've never had the privilege of getting to know you, Paul, but it was just wonderful to, to hear you today. So we're going to be turning to our message, and just before we do, let me remind us that each week we encourage uh, two offerings. The one offering is always for the work we do here at Maranatha to serve the Lord. And thank you for your investment in what God is doing here. And uh, the, the second offering is for UCB Canada, which is United Christian Broadcasters, for uh, the radio stations we can pick up as we're driving from this place to that place around town. And you can give in the foyer, in the baskets there, or you can give online. Now today, uh, we are... Uh, in a sermon series called, you know, called Summer Fruits. It's all about the fruits of the Holy Spirit, these character qualities that are described in the book of Galatians, chapter 5, verses 22 and 23. And so we've talked about love, joy, and peace, and, uh, and um, patience, and kindness, and goodness, and faithfulness. And today, we've, we're, we should focus on gentleness, but here's the thing. I actually preached on gentleness on February 27th. So if you want to hear all about gentleness, 
listen to the sermon of the February 27. But I want to get at this characteristic in a little bit different way. I, I want to just simply look at Jesus' invitation to us all today to come to him and find rest because in it he describes himself as someone who is gentle and who is humble. Now normally at this point in the message I would say please turn in your Bibles to a particular place, in this case Matthew 11, 28 through 30, or I'd say follow it on the screen. But today I don't want you to do either of those things. I just want you to quiet your heart and I want you to listen as David Suchet reads this wonderful invitation from Jesus. Listen to these words. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Now, how do you experience that invitation? Um, in such a distracted world, it's possible that you were, we were halfway through it before you even started listening to it. So we're going to listen to it again. Just listen, relax, allow this to penetrate your hearts. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Again, I want to ask you, how did you experience that? Now, I want to listen to that w one more time. And this time, I want you to, if you have to close your eyes, go ahead and close your eyes. But listen to these words. Jesus is speaking to you personally. And he's extending this invitation to you. Just receive it into your whole being. Let's listen. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. In my experience of 35 or so years of ministry, I find that people really resonate with that invitation. I have experienced that on many occasions that I've simply read those words or spoken those words and felt in the congregation a palpable sense of relaxing. We all deeply feel we know, we believe, we, or that we know that we need what Jesus is offering. And we're not talking about physical rest. If you want physical rest, we go on a vacation. But we're talking about something different. We're talking about uh, what a, a vacation cannot give you. We're talking about rest of soul, something right down deep in our heart, this sense of satisfaction or peace in life. And so I want to ask you a question this morning that I'm going to be asking you again and again because really it all boils down to this. And the question is, do you want that rest? Because Jesus says, this is not hard. I am offering you this rest. Do you want this rest? And that, that question may be a little harder to answer than, than we realize, but let's look at the invitation. Let's explore it. And here it is. This is not hard. Jesus says, do you want rest? If you want rest, here's, here, here it is in a nutshell. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. End of story. Do you want rest? There it is. This is not complicated. Now, let's think about those words. If those words are familiar to us, they might just go right over our head. Um, Jesus says, take my yoke upon you. Now, think about it. That doesn't offhand sound like a wonderful invitation. A yoke is something we put on oxen when they're going to pull a plow. It's something we put on a horse when we want uh, that horse to pull a carriage. And when a human wears a yoke, it looks something like this. So there's a man carrying a yoke, right, to balance the load. 
And at first, if we really think about these words, we, we, we think, well, Jesus, wait a minute. You say you want to give us lo- uh, rest, and now you're saying, then take this load on you. Well, here's what's going on here. Jesus isn't saying, I'm going to give you a yoke because I want to burden you. Jesus is saying, you are already wearing a yoke of sorts. And you can take the picture down at this point. No, not, I don't need to see that. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, but uh, Jesus is saying, you are, you are wearing a yoke. So a yoke is simply our way of looking at the world, the values we take to it, the, 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 the presuppositions or the assumptions we have about life, all of the things that go into dealing with the stuff of life, the stuff that we take to us, and all of us have, have this going on. And sometimes, and now I want to see that picture up there, if you would, please. Sometimes what it looks like is that. And we're trying to get by life. We're trying to do our life responsibilities, but it's hard. And it's not just hard because life is hard, it's hard because of the yoke we are bearing. And you can, you can remove that now, if you would. Now, in order to understand what Jesus is saying about your yoke, we need to go back and understand what he was saying about the yoke of the people he was talking about. They would have instantly known. This is kind of a foreign concept. We don't have horses running around and oxen in our streets. But this was a a very common concept to them. And in their day, they they knew immediately what Jesus was talking about. He's talking about the yoke of the law or the yoke of God or the yoke of the kingdom of God, the will of God as it's revealed in scripture. And the problem is that the teachers of that time and the Pharisees had made it so complicated that it was a burden. So if, for example, in Matthew 23, verse 4, Uh, Jesus says they tie up heavy, cumbersome loads and put them on other people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to lift a finger to move them. And Peter talked about this cumbersome law in this way. In Acts 15, he said, it's a yoke that neither we nor our ancestors have been able to bear. And that's why Eugene Peterson in the message of the Bible gives an absolutely brilliant translation of this passage when he says this, are you tired? Are you worn out? Burned out on religion? Come to me, get away with me and you'll recover your life. These people were burned out on religion. You may be burned out on religion. There are a lot of people in our society, I think, who are burned out and have been burned out on religion, religion being faith in a way that God never intended it. And so I come back to you and I say, what is the yoke you are carrying? Let's look at that picture once again. What is the yoke you are carrying? Is it a light yoke, the one Jesus offers us? Or in some senses, are you walking like this? carrying something that is making your life more difficult than it needs to be. So anxiety. Uh, Sometimes we experience a deep anxiety in life. We feel like all of the cares of the world are resting right on our shoulders. Well, that's a yoke that we're never intended to bear. Or how about this? How about per, a performance orientation, this feeling that if I, do, if I fail uh, in, a, in, in a task, then I fail in life. I won't be loved. I won't be valued if I don't perform. Or what about this? What about comparison? Uh, we look at uh, other people's lives, and we're always in a perpetual state of saying, oh, I don't have enough, or I'm not enough, because look at the people around me. Or, or how about this? How about things that seep into our life because of our, our view of life, like bitterness and angry and unforgiveness. You know, these things literally, they make us sick. They will make us physically sick. Talk about a yoke we were not intended to bear. Uh, or guilt or shame or a drivenness about life. Or a living for the approval of other people. Or, or, or trying to find rest in a credit card. Or trying to find rest in sex. And Jesus says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. And it really comes down to this. Jesus says, are you prepared to take my yoke 
upon you. That can be a little harder than we realize. Now, we're going to watch a video clip by, the man, by a man by the name of Patrick Lencioni. And let me tell you about Patrick Lencioni. Somebody gave me a book by Patrick Lencioni, and I, 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 I've known and respected Patrick Lencioni. He speaks to the corporate world a lot uh, about how to run business, very well-known person. I knew he was a Christian, but I was struck in this book how explicitly Christian he was. And so I looked him up and I found this video where he talks about the time when he decided to take Jesus' yoke. He doesn't use those words, but you'll see it's a beautiful explanation about him coming to a moment of deciding that he wanted Jesus' yoke and not the one he had been bearing. Let's watch this video. St. John of the Cross has a fabulous, amazing quote, and that is, if a bird is, is attached by a chain or by a string, it doesn't matter because it still can't fly. And I was completely tied down by strings that almost seemed invisible, like there's nothing wrong here, but I was completely attached to the things of this world, and I had n no satisfaction. And so I prayed to God. I said, God, please take me out of, transform me, make me humble, make me pure. Let me live for you and not for all these other things. And I had this overwhelming response from him. I, f I had this overwhelming response that he said, are you sure? Because it's going to be really hard for you. Because I had spent 43 years of my life living for largely for myself. Though in an externally virtuous way, I wanted to be, well, to be successful. I wanted people to see me that way. I wanted to be in control. I wanted to be self-reliant. I wanted to be resourceful. I wanted to prove that I could start businesses and help clients and be well-known and do all these things. And I said, God, I, I want to let go of that. And he said, it's going to be so hard for you. Are you sure? And it reminds me of that in, that, in the movie Jesus of Nazareth, when Peter t Jesus turns to, to Peter and says, are you going to leave? And he says, where else can I go? And I said to myself, God, what else can I do? So he answered my prayer. Over the course of the next five or six years, and I'm still going through it, but it's, it's a beautiful thing, he started to give me the same experience that that football player went through. I hit rock bottom. Now, mercifully, he didn't make me go through what so many people have to go through when they hit rock bottom. I did not cheat on my wife, thank you, Lord. I did not do drugs and alcohol. I didn't shame my family, thank you, Lord, for that. But I experienced such a profound sense of emptiness and sadness. I mean, I cannot describe it to you. I can only think of that book, The Dark Night of the Soul, that I lost every ability I had to enjoy the good things in my life. I, I took no joy out of the external things anymore. I remember the, the moment that it occurred to me, I was at Radio City Music Hall, standing on stage, delivering a presentation at a big leadership conference. And there were other dignitaries and celebrities and politicians, presidents, former presidents of the United States. And I was speaking at Radio City Music Hall, and I gave my speech and it was rated the number one speech at the conference and there were people applauding for me and I walked off stage like this and I was catatonic and I stumbled out the backstage exit, walked down to St. Patrick's Cathedral, hit my knees in front of Jesus and said, I got nothing left. And that's when I realized it's only Jesus. What a beautiful description of an individual coming to a place where they say, I'm done with my yoke. Jesus, I'm ready to accept your yoke. And, and as he said, this is going to be hard for you, Patrick, because really, you know, you know, Jesus went and he asked a person who was, you know, sick. He said, do you want to be well? And we think, what a dumb question. We all want to be well. But the truth is we don't all want to be well. Uh, we could very, very much love our condition or, or be so used to it that we can't envision a life and, and, and we're, 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 we want the, you know, the demons that we know rather than the one that we don't. And Jesus says, no, you've got to come to this place where you say, I'm done with my yoke. I really am. I want yours, Jesus. And this isn't a, just a decision we make at one point in our life. It starts there. But it's a decision, Jesus said, it's every day. Every day we have to decide again. 
Am I going to carry Jesus' yoke, which he promises uh, is, is so much better than my own? Now, what, what's going to happen? Let's say you, you say yes. You know, I'm going, I, I'm going to, you know, Jesus, let you come in and, and, and move me and guide me and empower me. I'm going to live your kind of a life. Uh, and I'm going to do this. And we say this every day. What, what can you expect to happen to you? And this is, here are some things you can expect to hack it, happen. Well, first of all, you will experience that this yoke is easy and the burden is light. Uh, a, a yoke that is well fitted for you. So think about uh, a, a shoe that has a bump of leather in it and you walk on it for a day and you get this blister. Uh, or I know somebody who used to Vaseline his toes because he did marathons and he said, you know, you don't think of toes as as chafing, but after 42.2 kilometers, it can be miserable. Uh, an ill-fitting yoke is one that is a burdensome, a, a horrible thing. And, and Jesus says, I will give you one that's designed for you and for the world as it is. Uh, Matthew, uh, uh, excuse me, Eugene Peterson, again, a brilliant translation of this text, interprets it this way in the message version. He says, walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of life. You see, or of grace, excuse me. So you see, this is what Jesus says. I, I'm going to give you a yoke, but it's going to be easy. It's going to fit. It's going to fit with the world the way it is. It's going to fit with who God created you to be. You're going to learn from me the unforced rhythms of life. You see, that's what the will of God was supposed to be and, and is supposed to be. And the will of God, as he real, reveals it for scripture, in Scripture is supposed to be a well-fitting yoke. The, the, the teachers of the law and sometimes the religionists or we in our own minds make it something different. But Jesus says, no, I, I, I want you to become a disciple of mine. I want you to be reconnected to God. I want you to know this easy, well-fitting uh, yoke of the will of God for your life. Uh, I, I had a professor in seminary once who, who told me something. I don't know how he, he, he was privy to this conversation, but when the Calvin University campus was built, and if you've ever been there, you know this is a beautiful campus. Uh, you know, there are buildings and these meandering paths that lead to the buildings and the, these beautiful uh, trees and bushes. And they were discussing, they had just built the campus and some of the, 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 the buildings, and, and, and they said, okay, now we have to put in the paths. And they were making this decision about where to put in the paths. And one wise person on the board said, why don't we not put in the paths? Why don't we wait and see where people walk? Isn't that brilliant? So instead of imposing a way of life on people, a way they're supposed to walk, we'll see where they do walk. And that's the will of God. When we come to Jesus, he says, uh, you know, this isn't just anarchy. I do whatever I want. No, he says, there's a purpose for God. You have to get to those buildings. But we're, I'm going to work in a way that suits you. As he said to the Pharisees, the Sabbath, God did not, uh, man was not made for the Sabbath, but the Sabbath for man. And so I will... I will give you a gent an easy, a well-fitting yoke. But here's, what, here's the second thing you can expect if you take Jesus' yoke on you. And that is he will, be gentle, he will be humble and gentle with you. Now I want you to think about why it is we are so guarded in our lives. When you're in the foyer talking to someone, you know, you don't lay it all out there, all of your aches and pains. You can be sitting here with stuff that you don't even tell your neighbor. Why? Well, we fear that people will be harsh with us. We fear that we will be judged, we will be seen as weak or whatever. We feel like we need to save face. And so we are guarded and that's why we cannot, that's why we're not good teachers often because we lack that gentleness. But Jesus says, you come to me and this is, this is what you, you can know, that I am gentle and I am humble and I will, I, I, you will be safe. When I died for you, I knew who you were. I know who you are. There are no surprises. You may be surprised by your sin, but I'm not. And I will hold you, and I will love you within that context. And when I deal with the hard stuff in your life, I will deal with it gently. Think about it when you go to a dentist 
or you go to a surgeon, why is it that you submit yourself to that? They're going to do something horrible. They're going to hurt you. Why do you do that? Because you know it's good for you, and that you know that they're working for you. And in the same way, Jesus says, when I have to deal with the hard stuff of life, I won't do it in a judgmental way. And you know, we need to be such surgeons of the soul. Uh, Paul says this to us. He says, brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. If we become this gentle kind of people, then the person who's failed in life who says, no, I wouldn't go into a church. Look at my life. They come and they feel safe. We feel safe with one another. Jesus says, I am a gentle and humble teacher. Well, one more thing. If you accept Jesus' yoke and live this life from day to day and learn from him, this is what's going to happen. He is going to teach you personally. He's going to teach you. You will be an apprentice. I love that word. You will be an apprentice to Jesus. And Jesus will be involved in your life moment by moment. Leighton Ford has written a book called The Attentive Life. We need to be attentive because Jesus takes his disciples and he teaches them every day. There's not a second when he's not teaching you. So for example, you are at a a grocery store and you're standing in a long line and you see this sign on the cashier that says cashier in training. Well, you have two choices. You can tap your foot and look down and look at your watch. Or you can say, God is teaching me patience. And maybe you look at the person in front of you, or or here's another example, you're interrupted. You know, we think of our interruptions as exactly that, interruptions, but how do you know that that interruption isn't the biggest reason God has planned your day? There are no accidents. Or these sandpaper people we talked about, or or, 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 or when we do feel overwhelmed and we feel like, "I, I can't handle life, I feel so much responsibility, hey, Good news from God, you know, Dallas Willard puts it this way, you are not responsible for outcomes. Only God can make an outcome, but we are just responsible to be faithful. Every day, Jesus will shape us and mold us, his promise to you. Now, I had a beautiful moment. I debated whether to share this. I think God wants me to share this. But for me, it's an example of how personally Jesus is in our life. So I had this wonderful moment with my granddaughter. We cared for my my granddaughters for about a week. And uh, she had this tooth going on. It was just hanging by a flap of skin, and everyone was encouraging her, let's just rip it off. And she got scared and everything. And, And she was sitting on my lap, and I just said to her, I said, Hannah, shall we pray about your tooth? She said, yes. So I just kind of whispered in her ear and we prayed that God would take care of it and that she could know his love. And then that led to orthodontics because her parents had talked to her that one day she's going to get braces and she said, why do, why do I have to get braces? And then it became very, very vulnerable and you've got to imagine there's all of this noise around and, and we're just little whispers, we're talking like this way. And I said, well, Hannah, I said, you know, you want to have a, a smile that you're, you're, you're pleased with because smiles make such a difference to people. And if we, whether you're a teacher, you're in an office. And I said, you know, Grandpa never got that. Uh, Grandpa, my parents couldn't afford orthodontics, and so sometimes I'm not happy with my smile. But you have that privilege. And then she said something. I, it was amazing. She said, but you're God's little baby. And it was like a word from God to me. Like, yeah, that's really the, the news I wanted to hear. But it, it bewildered me that that came out of nowhere. And then she said something even more bewildering. She said, what does that mean? It almost like God just put it in her mind and she just said it. And then I just had this glorious moment. I said, I've been born again. And if you know the story of Jesus talking to Nicodemus on the roof and where where Nicodemus says, does that mean going into my mother's womb and being born again? It was kind of like that in a little seven-year-old way. And I got to explain how God, Jesus had come into my heart and he made me new. And he, he, gave me, he made me want to love people rather than the direction I was going. And, and I said, you can know that you belong to him if you love him and you know that that has happened in your heart. And right in that moment, it was like, Jesus, you are here. You are, you are feeding 
this, you are making this conversation happen. All I need to do is follow the trail. Jesus was teaching her. Jesus was teaching me in this moment. And every moment, if we're attentive, we will see that he will, he will lead us. He will guide us. Now, quickly, it helps. You know, he's doing it all in all of life, but, but it will help us if we each adopt a rule of life. So let me read you a definition of a rule of life that Peter Gregg gives. He says, a rule of life is a set of principles and practices we build into the rhythm of our daily lives, helping us to deepen our relationship with God and to serve him more faithfully. So I think one of the reasons I was able to tune into what God is doing is because I have a rule of life and it involves praying in the the morning. So we might pray, we might read the Bible, we might say to ourselves at 10 o'clock in the morning, I'm gonna stop and I'm gonna think about God. Right after lunch, I'm going to stop and I'm going to just put my attentions on God for a minute. Uh, we're going to pray around the table and you kind of def- you define what it's going to be, what the patterns are going to be for you so you, you could remain attentive to how Jesus is teaching you and so that he has that fuel that he could use in your life. And so I want to come back to the question that's been driving this whole sermon and that is, do you want that rest? Uh, Jesus says to you right now, he says, you can have my rest, take my yoke upon you, and enter into an apprenticeship with me, be intentional about that, and I will show you the unforced rhythms of life. One time I saw two quotes put side by side, and I was quite moved by this juxtaposition of quotes, The one is, the mass of men lead lives of quiet desperation, Henry David Thoreau. And the other was from Jesus, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. How's it going? How is your yoke working out for you? And do you want that life that leads into that abundant life? This is what Jesus is offering And each of us has to decide how much do we want that rest. Let's pray. Father in heaven, uh, thank you so much that out of your incredible love for people like us who in every way rebelled, in every way gave you all sorts of reasons not to love us, I thank you that for such as us, you sent your son, you gave what mattered most to you, so that we could be yours. You are such a gentle and humble and overwhelming God. We are sorry that we sometimes make you a Grinch, that we sometimes make you our enemy rather than our friend and our taskmaster. And we we're sorry on the other hand for that our, our, our sloth, Lord, that, that we sometimes just simply don't apply ourselves to embrace all that you have for us. And I'm just praying that today, this could be the day that we enter into not just the physical rest, not just the rest for my, my, my body, not just a, a rest of contentment the way Patrick Lencioni for a long time thought he had rest, he thought he had it, but we want the rest that Jesus offers. Give us the grace to make that choice and to make it day by day and to increasingly experience your yoke upon us, fellowship with you. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.
You know, something that strikes me that uh, you, you wouldn't know unless you were in the planning of the services is just how sometimes the Holy Spirit just weaves together the whole service. Like, you know, the, the praise band has just the slightest little paragraph to try to base their songs on, but I could not have picked a better song. You know, our heart needs a surgeon, and what a great surgeon of the heart God is. And maybe your heart needs a surgeon today. Maybe you're sensing that and you're in good hands with God. I just want to say something. If you're visiting with us today, why don't you stop by the, the uh, welcome desk and pick up a package. We have a package for you, uh, a little gift from us to you. Fill out a card. Let us know you've been here. Uh, we'd love to get to know you better. And with that, we're coming to the end of our, of our service. If you want prayer for anything, there will be people um, who are waiting for you right here at the platform. They, they've got hearts, beautiful hearts to pray, and they'll pray for you. Receive this blessing from God. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. May God be praised. May God be praised. Praise God from whom all